Hi. In previous videos, I've highlighted many ways that you can go about training word embeddings. From a high overview, though, most of them are trained via some sort of a neural network that looks like this. You'll have a token coming in on the left-hand side here that is being represented in this one-hot encoded array. That passes a feed-forward layer. You then have a dense representation over here. And then there can be one or many feed-forward layers that eventually lead to a prediction. And typically this prediction could be predict the next token, but it can also be predict which other tokens live in the same context. There are some variants of this, but by and large, you're usually doing something like this. Now, the big idea here is that by having a network like this, you'll get some sort of gradient feedback coming from your prediction error over here. That's going to propagate forward, which in turn will update these feed forward layers. And this will ensure that whatever representation you'll get here can be seen as a summary for this particular input. And again, there are many different variants, but this is a general procedure. And having these embeddings is great and all, but if I'm thinking in the context of digital assistants, then usually I'm not dealing with a single word at a time. In the domain of digital assistants, we need embeddings for sentences, not individual words. So how would you go about that? Well, one thing that you can do is you can say, well, the vector that I have for a sentence, let's say that that's the sum of all the vectors that I have for all of the words in that sentence. Or I'll take the average, I'll divide by the number of words. Now, this is something that you can do, but your results might vary if you go down this route. What you're looking at here is a similarity chart. I am showing the cosine distance between embeddings of sentences. What I've done is I've taken the word embeddings from every single word in a sentence. I have then taken the average of these embeddings. And what I'm doing is I'm showing which combinations of sentences are similar or dissimilar. And looking at this chart, you will notice that there aren't too many clusters appearing. And this is despite the fact that there's definitely different topics in here. Now, these sentences were taken from the Raza demo bot, and these first five sentences that you see are all about, hey, who built you? We then have a couple of questions about the age of the assistant. And next, we've got a couple of questions about the language. And if these were proper sentence embeddings, then I would expect there to be something of a cluster over here, another one over here, and a final one over here. Now, it should be said that there is some clustering happening. If I squint my eyes a little bit, I feel confident that, yeah, this over here looks like a cluster. But I'm still seeing a little bit too much similarity over here. So as far as a sentence embedding goes, adding or averaging word embeddings has limits. So in this video, I would like to discuss methods that can be used to construct proper sentence embeddings. And in particular, I'll describe some of the techniques that are described in the universal sentence encoder paper, which was written by employees of Google. Let's first take a step back before we go into architecture details, just to observe what's different from training word embeddings and sentence embeddings. Initially, we would try to predict the next token, let's say, and as a side effect, we would get this intermediate result that we could use as an embedding. If we're interested in doing this for sentences though, we immediately are confronted with the fact that we typically have not one input and one output, but that we have a sequence of inputs that have to be pooled together somehow. So immediately, this is going to cause our diagram to look substantially different. We'll start with a sentence, and this sentence will have tokens, and Sure, that sequence of tokens can go through some layers, but we will also need to do some pooling. And that is because the final embedding that we would like to get out over here, that needs to have a consistent shape. It'd be awkward if longer sentences didn't have the same embedding shape as shorter sentences. Now, one thing to observe here is that in the case of a sentence embedding, typically what you might wanna have is that this final layer at the end here, 
that that is going to be what you're going to send out as an embedding. This is different than what we did over here, because here we notice that it can be perfectly fine to maybe take the first feed forward layer here to define your embedding. In a sentence embedding, you would typically not do that. And the reason is as follows. Instead of having just one task that you're training on, and let's say the next token, you can predict that, but that will be one single task. But if you wanna have general sentence embeddings, it might be a good idea to also add some other tasks. Maybe we've got a data set of sentiments and we wanna have an embedding that can also be used to predict the sentiment of a sentence. And you can also imagine that perhaps we have some question answer pairs. You might be able to get more general embeddings if you attach it to not one, but many different tasks. Because sentences on their own can be much more expressive than single words, there's something to be said that if you want something to be general, that you will need more than one task in order to capture all of that possible expressiveness. So high over, this architecture over here will be substantially different than the one that we use over here. The universal sentence encoder paper, however, describes two main architecture types, how you could go about this layering and pooling. And I won't go into too many details, but I'll just give an overview of how they work. So let's say that we have our sentence with their separate tokens. Then what kind of architecture can we use to maybe pull that together in a nice way? Well, you might be reminded by the transformer architecture that we discussed in the previous video. If we just have a look at the encoder part of that algorithm, then the most important parts would be a multi-head attention layer followed by a feed forward layer. And what I'm drawing here is a simplification. There is a positional encoder you would typically see here. And there's also this addition and normalization happening between the drawn layers so far. But one thing that we could do is we could say, well, let's repeat this a bunch of times. And then finally, what we could do is we could have an output at the end. And we could say, well, everything that's coming out over here, let's just pull that together by taking the sum. That way, what comes out over here can be a numeric array of a fixed size. Now, this roughly sketched idea is what the paper refers to as their transformer-based encoder. But they also mention a deep averaging network. Again, you would have some tokens that are part of a sentence. But the main difference compared to before is that we don't apply this pooling at the end here. But instead, we do it at the beginning. The very first thing you do is you average the tokens coming in. And additionally, what you can also do is not just average the tokens in the sentence, but perhaps to also calculate the cross products between those vectors and add these in as well. And after this, you would simply follow up with feed forward layers, and you would repeat this also a bunch of times. Because we've averaged in the beginning, we also do not need to pool the output that comes out of this feed forward layer here. So that means that likewise, we've got our output here. Now let's see what happens if we attach multiple tasks here. Let's say that I've got task one. Well, if there's going to be a gradient update, then it will propagate via this output all the way back to whatever multi-head attentions that I've got, which means that all of these layers here will get an update. And if I were to have another task, a very similar thing would happen. And note that the exact same argument also applies here. One thing to keep in mind here is that for every single token that we've drawn here, there should be a word embedding attached that is learned. So for both of these approaches, that gradient update will at some point also cause the embeddings attached to these tokens to update. But the main merit of doing all of this is that you should get a general representation that comes out of both of these outputs. 
Despite their architectures being slightly different, I hope it's clear that if we perform this on enough data and enough tasks, that we might get a representation over here that is in fact relatively general and therefore maybe, and therefore also perhaps universal, which is where the name comes from. Now, with this high level overview out of the way, I would like to just highlight a effect that you can expect when you're using these kinds of embeddings. Remember that similarity chart I showed earlier? Here's what the averaged spacey embeddings tell us about how perhaps this data is clustered. Now let's compare that to embeddings that come out of this universal sentence encoder. That would look something like this. And note that what I'm using here is the transformer encoder. But if you were using the deep averaging network, you would get something that looks really similar. Note these clusters that appear. That might just be exactly what you want to have. These embeddings seem to capture something about the entire sentence, as opposed to merely averaging what these different words could represent. Now, if you're interested in playing around with these embeddings, note that they are now available in the what lies package as well. You can download both the transformer encoder as well as the deep averaging encoder so you can have a play with it. But I should warn you, even though these universal sentence encoders seem to capture something quite interesting about a sentence, it might still be a little bit of overkill. And if you're using the diet classifier, then you might not need it. In the next video, I'll explain why.